Yeah, thank you very much uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me to this great conference. Um, so what I'll do is I'll uh, dedicate uh, most of the talk uh, to talk about some new ideas we have uh, for understanding the, the nonlinear Hall effect and time reversal invariant materials. Uh, but having so many great experimentalists in the audience, I could not avoid the temptation of talking about some other stuff. So this are going to be basically very quick uh, elevator pitch type of uh, talks about some new proposals uh, that we have uh, for detecting certain kind of spin liquid states. And uh, also a proposal to, to detect um, a conventional type of a collective mode in strongly interacting metals. Yeah, so this is uh, a one slide summary of the main ideas I want to convey in this first part of the talk, the part that is related to the nonlinear Hall effect. So I want to convince you that in metals, that lack inversion symmetry, there is a correction to Newton's law uh, according to which the acceleration of the electron liquid scales not with the, with the linear applied force, but instead with the square of the applied force or, or applied force or applied electric field. And this a correction to Newton's law, this acceleration is, is always orthogonal to the applied electric field, so it's a kind of whole acceleration. And it's controlled by the Berry curvature type, which is defined as the gradient of the Berry curvature uh, with respect to momentum over the occupied state. And I'll show you how this uh, nonlinear whole acceleration is behind the nonlinear Hall effect that can be present in time reversal invariant materials. And then I'll present to you a remarkable sum rule that we found for the rectification conductivity of time reversal invariant materials. So basically, if you take the rectification conductivity of time reversal invariant materials and you integrate it over frequency, you will get a quantity that depends only on the very connection of the bands. It's completely independent of band energies. This is why we call it quantum geometric sum rule. So this net rectification spectral weight, if you wish, is a purely quantum geometric quantity for, for time reversal invariant materials. So let me begin by reminding you about the notion of through the weight. So the through the weight is one of the central uh, notions in our understanding of metals. It basically tries to, to answer uh, the question of what happens to Newton's second law of the metal. So if you were in the ideal clean limit, you know, the electrons will accelerate under applied electric field, and the, through the weight will measure basically the inverse inertia of the liquid. What happens in realistic systems is that the electrons eventually saturate into some terminal velocity. And that terminal velocity is basically what determines the conductivity. But the importance of the through the weight, in a sense, is that it measures this intrinsic inertia of the, of the electron loop. The conductivity always has intertwined the information of the friction that the electrons are experiencing with their inertia. So the through the weight is, in a sense, a more fundamental notion when you're thinking about a fluid, because it's measuring its inertia. The, the, the friction will depend on you know, how clean is the substance, and so on, how, how clean is the material. So it's, it's, it's extrinsic. Um, so but you know, more, more practically, basically, what you will do to compute the, the, this inertia of the electron liquid is to integrate the through the hole the integral, if there is a good separation between interband and intraband transitions, the integral of this through the peak will, will measure basically the inverse inertia of the liquid. So 
let's consider a simple question that you know I, actually I'm surprised that nobody had considered before. Let's try to compute the acceleration of electrons in a block band, the acceleration operator. So for that, let me quickly remind you of how to construct the position operator projected into a block band. So in vacuum, you know, position is just the gradient with respect to momentum. In a crystal, uh, you can show that the position operator is basically the gradient with respect to crystal momentum plus the very connection. And so this has a very important consequence, uh, which is that the projected position operator into a block band is no longer commutative along different directions. And basically, the very curvature is the quantity that measures this lack of commutativity of position operators. So this is a very nice way to think about very curvatures as an operator. It's some operator that is diagonal in crystal momentum and is locally measuring how much the position operators projected into a band uh, lack in the commute. So once you know that representation of the position operator is basically a two-line exercise to, de to derive this famous formula for the anomalous velocity. So take the Hamiltonian of a single block band coupled to a uniform electric field. And so the velocity is just the derivative of the position with respect to time, which you can compute just by taking the commutator with the Hamiltonian. And you'll find two pieces. One is this uh, group velocity, and the other comes because of this lack of commutativity of the projected position operators. <coughs> so you'll get the, that the velocity operator has this extra anomalous piece, which is uh, proportional to the, to the cross product of the very curvature and the applied force. So then, you know, let's go one step further and consider the rate of change of the velocity operator. So it's basically also a very, a, a very simple one line, a couple of lines of math to take the commutator of this operator with this Hamiltonian. And you will arrive at the following expression for the acceleration. So the acceleration operator is made out of three pieces. The first piece is just Newton's law, so one part that gets with the light force and the, and the inverse mass, effective mass. There is another piece that is just basically the, the instantaneous rate of change of the anomalous <coughs> velocity. So imagine that the electric field is changing in time, then the velocity will change in time. So that, that will give a contribution to the, to the acceleration. But there is an extra piece uh, that scales with the square of the electric field. And the coefficient controlling this, the proportionality of this bilinear of electric <coughs> acceleration is the gradient of the Berry curvature with respect to momentum. So it's this Berry dipole. So the Berry dipole measures a kind of Nonlinear acceleration, a nonlinear through the weight that metals can have when they, they have no inversion symmetry. So, how to get the, the, the nonlinear Hall effect uh, from these ideas very quickly? So, you know, you could do Boltzmann transport uh, to get the nonlinear Hall effect very, very, very quickly. So, basically, you know, in the steady state, when there is Scattering the distribution function will settle into some new distribution function that is just basically the displaced distribution function controlled by the by the scattering rate. So if you just do a Taylor series um, of this expression and gather the second order terms, you will find two terms. So one is a purely semi-classical term, does not require very curvatures. But you will also get an additional term that is uh, proportional to this gradient of the Berry curvature of the occupied states, but it's also proportional to the scattering rate. So this is how we understood this, this effect a few years ago with Yang. But so basically what I'm trying to say now is that maybe a, a deeper way or a better way to conceptualize this, to conceptualize this is that here when you're computing the, the, the current, you're seeing basically the terminal velocity of electron flow. So this calculation of the nonlinear conductivity is contaminated, quote unquote, from the information of the scattering rate, of the friction that the electrons are experiencing. 
a better way to think of it is this very curvature dipole is as a type of nonlinear through the way, something that measures an acceleration as I introduced first. So, but let's see what are the essential properties of this very curvature dipole. So there is basically two conditions uh, that you need to satisfy for this early dipole to be non-zero. Uh, first, the material needs to break inversion symmetry. You know, any second order response uh, coefficient in the electric field will, will vanish if you have inversion symmetry. Um, but the material needs to also be a metal. So it's clear because it's an average over occupied states of a gradient, so at zero temperature, you know, because of periodicity of the pre-run zone, this will vanish for a completely occupied band. So, you know, and that makes sense. As I just said at the beginning, it's, it's measuring a metallic property. It's measuring an acceleration. Insulators are not supposed to accelerate. So just like the through the weight, it vanishes for insulators. But the important point is that it, 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 it's non-zero for metals that break inversion symmetry. So, so in a sense, it is a form of order parameter for broken inversion symmetry in metals. And, you know, importantly, the, the Berry curvature is odd under time reversal, but the gradient of the Berry curvature is even under time reversal. So this average can be non-zero even in, in, in a time reversal invariant system. So, so the general conditions for it to be non-zero is that you, you need to have a metal so for example, in 2D, you might imagine if you have some Fermi surface that's, you know, cut by a, by a mirror plane, then the Berry curvature will be forced to change sign. And then in 2D, for example, you can think of this Berry dipole as a, as, a, as a vector that points along this gradient of the Berry curvature. Okay? That's kind of the essence of the effect. So, the effect was uh, recently uh, experimentally discovered uh, by two groups following some initial um, first principle calculations by, by Binghai. Uh, so King, King Fai and, and Pablo basically, Pablo Harillo Herrero basically uh, independently, simultaneously discovered the, <coughs> the effect. Uh, if I will, will tell you more about the experiment, so I won't tell you much more about this. Um, right, so what I just showed you is basically sort of the, the simplest kind of single band picture for how to, to think about this, this effect. Uh, so what we did in this more recent paper was to develop a very general uh, second order theory of transport and optical effects in, a, in any band structure. So this, we, we basically sort of, you know, took the, the approach of some earlier pioneering works of using this gauge that makes the calculations much easier. And we added just one small ingredient to the perturbation theory, which is we, we did perturbation theory with an explicit relaxation rate. And this has the advantage that basically we can, you know, the, the, the complication of perturbation theory is more or less the same as in clean perturbation theory. But it has the advantage that you can take DC limits, AC limits safely. There is no issue. So we have a complete formula that captures, I claim, all second order optical transport effects uh, in any system, metal insulators, and as long as you can, you know, model the, the, the relaxation processes by relaxation time approximation, they, they should be in this formula. Um, okay, so, and with that formula of the very general second order conductivity, we found this uh, some rule. So let me state the conditions for, for, for this sum rule. So basically, it's a sum rule uh, uh, that is about the, the rectification conductivity to linearly polarized light. So that, that conductivity is measured by the real part of this uh, second order conductivity tensor with opposite frequencies, so that you get DC current. So the statement is, if you integrate the real part of that uh, tensor, 
you get a quantity that has no knowledge about band structure, uh, band energies, let's say, only about the very uh, curvatures and the very connections of the bands. Here, A bar is the off diagonal very, non abelian very connection, and the A is just the, the usual very connection. <coughs> it's quite remarkable, Sam rule. It knows nothing about the, the only condition is a time reversal symmetry. So the material needs to be time reversal symmetric, and it's, it, it's strictly true in the clean limit. Okay? So let me explain uh, where the terms come from. So this first term here is the Berry curvature dipole. This term comes from intraband processes. So this is the spectral weight of a very sharp through the light peak, you know, which is related to this nonlinear acceleration near zero frequency. So again, it's, it's like a through the weight. And these other terms all come from interband processes. So processes above the, 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 the interband optical pressure. But they are also purely quantum geometric. Um, so, where to study this? Uh, you know, vile semi-metals, as many previous speakers have emphasized, are natural platforms to, to, to understand um, non-linear non optical phenomena. So. Also in 3D, the, the sum rule is very interesting because the right-hand side, you know, has is, is uh, cubic in the Berry connection. So in, in, in three dimensions, it's dimensionless, like the theta angle in topological insulators. So in 3D, there's quite nice properties. The trace of this Berry curvature dipole tensor is also quantized in fundamental units in 3D. Um, so, so, so here, you know, with, with our formalism, we can, for example, uh, describe the crossover from the uh, quantized circular photovoltaic effect of, of Fernando and Adolfo and collaborators down to the low energy peak of the Berry dipole. So we have basically a theory that can describe all these interband and intraband processes in equal, on equal footing. And so the idea is that this spectral weight of, of the real part of those that rectification conductivity will measure this um, nonlinear through the weight of, of vile semi-metals. Okay. Another interesting, uh, an interesting platform within this vile semi-metal type of materials is this bismuth tellurium iodine. It's a trivial insulator that can be driven into a TI with pressure. And we have done some recent first principle calculations that show that this very dipole is largely enhanced near that transition. So, so just by measuring transport, this nonlinear transport, you can basically observe the, the, the features of this topological trivial to, to the eye transition. Yeah, so that's basically the summary of this first part. So metals without inversion symmetry have an anomalous acceleration that is controlled by the very curvature dipole, which is a gradient of the very curvature over momentum space average of that gradient, and it gives rise to this non-linear hole effect that is allowed in time reversal invariant materials. And also, the, there is a, a, a remarkable sum rule for the, for the rectification conductivity that, that uh, characterizes rectification through linearly polarized light in time reversal invariant materials. How, how much time do we have? Still five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah, so with that, basically, I close that first part, and let me kind of give you very quick, quick uh, elevator pitches of these other ideas. So this idea is an idea, it's a proposal for a smoking gun type experiment to detect some type of spin liquids, uh, so-called uh, spin liquids, the U1 spin liquids with, with gapless spinos. Uh, so basically, the idea is that these states are insulators for DC transport, so the real part of the conductivity goes to zero, but they are not completely dead insulators. So if you apply magnetic fields to them you and shine light, you can see an analog of the cyclotron resonance in these, uh, in these uh, materials. But there is a characteristic difference with respect to ordinary, ordinary metals, which is that they, they, they lack the cone mode. This is 
closely related to the fact that they have they are strongly coupled to a U1 gauge field. So in metals, typically the cone mode would be the strongest harmonic of the cyclotron resonance. Uh, so they they'll display all the higher harmonics, but they will lack the cone mode. The key challenge to observe this is that this the residue of this uh, higher harmonic peaks of cyclotron resonance will die as the materials become more and more insulated. So this is some proposal that would work for spin liquid candidates that are not too far from the mod metal insulator transition. In principle, they are always there, but you know, the, the residue of the peaks will, will just become vanishingly small as you go, as the material becomes more and more insulated in, in this fashion. It's, it's one word, mod gap to the fourth power, basically. So, you know, the spin on Fermi surface is a very interesting state. It's basically a state in which the electron breaks into a neutral fermion with an emergent photon coupled to some boson that carries no spin, but carries the charge. The boson is gapped, and these spinons are left at low energies to form, you know, a gapless Fermi surface state, basically. Uh, they, this state is believed, from the point of view of models, is believed to exist, that there is some, some, some arguments and, and numerical evidence that it might exist near the metal to isolator transition in the triangular Howard model. Okay? There is, a, there is a, a several candidate materials that are, that are consistent with this spin liquid hypothesis, tantalum disulfide, there is the, the organics, the MIT in particular. Uh, we also propose that maybe these uh, mixed balance insulators might have a state that is uh, closely related to spin on Fermi surface. So there is a few materials that are good candidates. So yeah, this tantalum disulfur, you mean it's a spin polarized? Or? So, you know, it, it orders into some charge density wave, yeah. uh, but it's left with one electron per unit cell. And there is no evidence of ordering of the spin of that electron. I see. So people have argued that it might be a spin, on, a spin liquid. So, you know, the, the reason why they display cyclotron resonance is very simple. You know, all you need to get cyclotron resonance is basically a mechanism for the spinons to form Landau levels and then to have a matrix element of coupling to light. So that when there is resonant absorption, you will. When, when the light frequency matches the, the, the lambda level spacing, you will get resonant absorption. And so basically the idea, you know, if anybody's interested, I can discuss this in more detail, is, you know, the physical photon is coupled to the to the chargon, which is making a mod insulator is gapped, but the chargon is, is coupled to the spin on via this emergent photon. So when you apply a physical magnetic field, the chargons sort of, you know, respond like an insulator, so they develop diamagnetism. So they self-consistently uh, produce an emerging gauge field for this for this photon. So the spin on C. So the spinons will have Landau levels, <coughs> physical magnetic field. And so it was pointed out some time ago also that in the absence of magnetic field, this state has a power low optical absorption. It's not a dead insulator. So it, it absorbs light at, at a very low frequency. So the idea we're, we're proposing basically is that, you know, combine magnetic field with that, you will see the cyclotron peaks. But, you know, the, there is basically the con mode is absent. Uh, and the, the, the idea to understand why it's absent, absent is simple. So the con mode, basically, this is a cartoon of the Fermi surface. So the, the con mode is the, the, the mode that appears from the L equal one, the form, you know, displacements of the Fermi surface, from the global displacements of the Fermi surface in the presence of a magnetic field. But those are frozen because of the coupling to the gauge field. But these higher harmonic deformations of a Fermi surface, like this dematic deformation of a Fermi surface, remain soft. This is the one that, this deformation of the Fermi surface is the one that gives rise to the second harmonic and so on. So this, this is why they have no con mode, but they have higher harmonic. So here is some numbers more specific. You know, you can plug the expected width that you will get from gauge field fluctuations for these peaks, and the width is still smaller 
compared to the peak energy. So, so they are in principle visible, but the key challenge, as I mentioned, is that the strength of the peaks will go down as the material becomes more insulated. And so very quickly, also just to, to give you the elevator pitch of this other idea. So, so we have found, um, uh, we, we're proposing some, 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 the appearance of some new collective molding correlated metals. Uh, you know, so metals typically have just a single collective mode outside of the particle hole continuum is this so-called plasma mode. But it's possible when you have strongly interacting Fermi liquids that they actually develop an extra collective mode. This extra collective mode is, is a little bit like the shear sound, the transverse waves of, of a solid, even though the system is still a liquid. So we have done some detailed calculations of, of the conductance of narrow channels, of clean narrow channels, in which you know clean meaning the width smaller than mean free path. And so this is this is a plot of that of that conductance. So the blue line is for the Fermi liquid that has the mode outside the, the, the particle hole continuum. The blue line is the one that, that has the modes, a Fermi liquid that has the mode outside of the particle hole continuum. And the orange is a Fermi liquid that would have the mode inside the particle hole continuum. So they have, they have some casts before the mode exits the continuum at the edge of the particle hole continuum. But these strongly interacting Fermi liquids that would have this shear sound mode will develop some resonant dips in the frequency dependence conductance controlled by the dispersion of this mode when you try to pass current to, to narrow channels. I can explain the intuition of that. It's actually very simple when you think about a crystal, what happens when a crystal and you are just pinning the boundaries, basically. So the, if you probe the electron liquid at the right frequencies, it responds like a crystal. It's kind of the, the bottom line, even though it's still a liquid. Yeah, so with that, let me Thank you for your attention. Questions? Uh, yes, yeah, summary of results is really interesting. Um, I had some idea on very, like, two band models. This, this summary is related to the skewness of the polarization distribution. Um, uh, and this seems, like, your result seems clearly, like, very general. So I was wondering whether you can relate it to a physical uh, property of the yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm aware. Yeah, of yeah I think you have, all you're yeah, mentioning. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, so the answer is no. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to connect it, but there's probably some connection. Yes, yeah, we physical. haven't worked out. We haven't just worked it out. Mm -hmm. It's probably, it's probably some general connection. That is some group that you I mentioned. If I, the spin on Fermi surfaces, I take it rock fermion and I got through or project it, right? To get a spin on Fermi surface, I take a rock fermion charge and I got through or project it, right? You, 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 uh, did why Dirac? No, it doesn't have to be Dirac. So, you know, in the single orbital Howard model in the triangular lattice, have one band, a field. How do I think of these Landau levels starting from a Gatula projected? Yeah, so you know, physically, basically what is happening is that when you apply magnetic field, there is some expectation for, for the spin chirality. Okay, so if you want to start like from the insulating sign, from the, from the Heisenberg type model, in the magnetic field, there will be some 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 expectation value for the spin chirality. And the spin ons, you know, when they move, they see this this spin chirality as a source of flux. It's one way to think about it from the very insulating limit. Near the mode transition, you know, maybe what what I sketch as a as a, as a principle, you know, it's it's basically the chargons, you know, they are weakly gapped, right? They are making an insulator. So they are trying to 
respond to the, to the applied magnetic field to screen it. Like, you know, they are a diamagnetic insulator, basically. So, but because of this, they are also self-consistent sources of this emerging gauge field. If I start in the large magnetic field limit where I have lambda levels. Oh, and then, this is, and then you know, this is just project. To, for you to see that they see a Lorentz force, okay? So it doesn't have to be large, right? So like cyclotron resonance, you know, there will be conditions, right? So there will be some omega C tau type condition for this peaks to be sufficiently visible. But you don't have to go to the ultra quantum limit. Okay? It's like cyclotron rest, but this is, you know, why I think it's, it's a good experimental proposal because it's like cyclotron resonance. Cyclotron resonance in a metal, you don't have to go to, to, to you know, ultra, ultra quantum limit to see. But for cyclotron resonance, you have to send a microwave to the excitation. So yeah. the microwave couples to the... Yeah, yeah, so that's the idea. They, they have some kind of Landau levels, they have some kind of Lorentz force. And they also have a dipole, some amount of dipole coupling to light. So they, they have for spin -off. absorption, yeah. They have at finite frequency, they have amount of coupling to light. This is why they have real part of conductivity that dies like it's a power law. This is the electric dipole. No, the magnetic dipole transition. Yeah, yeah, this is electric dipole. I mean, I guess if you have a Dirac fermion, right? So I think the story, I'm not, I don't remembering well, but the story was that you can, you're going to have to have a spin on Fermi surface because there's no way to kill the berry face even by, you know, gutter or projecting it. I see. So that guarantees. No, maybe this is a story I'm not very well, familiar I, I, with. I, I might be should. remembering it wrong, but I think that was the story. So now if I apply a magnetic field and then gutter or project, how do I see? We got to a projection. You know, the spin on like strongest. like the spin on in terms of microscopic wave functions is very poorly understood. So you're asking me a very tough question. <laughs> but yeah, let's you know the physics is more or less like what I described by the microscopic wave function. Did, did you try the sum rule for the circular uh, effect? Did you try integrating in frequency and See what happens, at least the low We did try to see something for circular, but we couldn't get anything particularly nice. So, might be just we didn't do, we're not clever enough for it. We try. Uh, well, simple question about the zero sum you mentioned. Yep. Uh, well, I, I assume here it's uh, like a but we said she died talking about uh, the chiral zero mode, chiral zero cell mm -hmm. yeah. from from yeah. the from the white yeah. metal. But we, uh, my, my question is even simple. Like uh, in kinetic system, before experiment uh, this zero sound, in which, what kind of system it was observed? This the shear sound. The shear sound. Yeah. So you know this mode was believed to be present in hel is believed to be present in helium three. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is very good for this question because this is something I did not emphasize. So, so, you know, the mode is believed to be outside of a particle hole continuum even in helium-3. But when you plug the, the Landau parameters of helium-3, it's just barely outside, okay? So in the 70s, people, there was an attempt to, 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 to detect this mode experimentally that claimed that they saw evidence, but it was then countered by some other papers. So it, it was not too much, like two papers on this. But in helium, it, it might be there, it's just too close to the particle hole continuum. But so what we're trying to emphasize is that this mode is present in metals, and it also remains linearly dispersing because it's a purely neutral current mode. And the criterion is very moderate, okay? So the quasi-particle mass, when you translate the criterion into how heavy the quasi-particles have to become for this to, to exit the continuum. This was already observed in some metals? No, it has not no. been observed. Okay. I know, so, but what I'm trying to say is it might be hanging around in a lot of metals because it just requires moderate interactions, but it's just very hard to excite and couple to it. So we, we basically are trying to propose these this, um, narrow channels, and also it might be possible by turning on small magnetic fields, because when you turn on magnetic fields, this mixes longitudinal and transverse modes, so that gives a little bit of uh, weight on the density for this mode. So this is the spectral weight of the density, density correlations, and this is the, the dispersion of the mode. So it, then you could do something like plasmonics. If you turn on a, a weak magnetic field near an edge, so you, you could do near field optics, the same kind of plasmonics that have been done to excite the plasmas in, in graphene. Thanks. Any more question? If not, let's back in here again.